Petrosian from Purdue University, and he will speak about almost minimizers for the thin obstacle problem. Thank you, Arsha. Uh, yes, uh, thank you, Daniela. So thank you for uh, for the invitation to give a talk in this uh, in this seminar series and. And I also want to thank uh, Yifeng and Corner. I think with this great idea of having this, uh, you know, uh, unified online seminar. Um, and as I said, so we we should probably keep keep this series going after the, the COVID. Okay, so um, so my uh, talk title so is almost minimizer for the thin obstacle problem. And uh, so this is a, a joint work with my student uh, Songmin Jeon. And uh, so if you excuse me, I'll just make a small advertisement. So for him, uh, he's, he'll be graduating uh, next spring. So, and he's, he's on the job market. Okay. So, um, all right. So, um, the, uh, so my, my talk will be divided in, into several parts. So I'll, I'll start with the uh, description of the thin obstacle problem. And uh, so this, this part might be very familiar to, to many of you. So, uh, so if we've seen my talks before. Um, and uh, then I'll move to almost minimizers in the, the simplest setting of the, uh, the Dirichlet integral. And then uh, I'll move to the almost minimizers for the uh, thin obstacle problem. And also, so after that, so I'll talk about some, some uh, you know, technical issues involved in, in the study of those uh, 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 problems, so all those almost minimizers. Okay, so uh, the thin obstacle problem, so also known as the Signorini problem. So suppose we are given a certain open set in Rn, so let's call that D, and um, then we have a, a certain smooth hypersurface, so call this M, so also call this a thin space, so this hypersurface is cutting through, through D, so it divides it into two parts, say uh, d minus and d plus. And then we are given a certain function uh, on, on this thin uh, um, manifold on, on the thin space. So uh, C, so which we call the thin obstacle. And also we are given certain function G uh, on the boundary of the domain. Okay, so those are just boundary values. So here's some visualization. So this is C, um, so the graph over the thin space. and um, so what we want to do, we want to minimize the Dirichlet integral among all functions with this given boundary values, G, uh, that stay above, so here U greater or equal to C, uh, of the, the graph of the, uh, the C, of the obstacle. So the minimizer will look something like this, okay? So there are, there are certain parts where the minimizer will, will stick you know, to, the, uh, to this, uh, uh, obstacle to the graph of the obstacle. So, but there are also parts that that away from the thin space. So, uh, where uh, it will not. So, and in fact, also on the thin space. So here there could be part where it's lifted. So it's it's above the the thin obstacle. Uh, so uh, now at the parts where uh, you know away from this thin space. So that is in this d minus and d plus. So this minimizer will simply be harmonic because again there is no constraint there. Um, and uh, so there's also a way to characterize the conditions for the minimizer on the thin space. So it turns out that the, the minimizing property is actually equivalent to, to these conditions, well, in a certain weak sense, uh, that uh, so this difference, this u minus c is no negative, meaning that u is above c. And then also we have the sum of this normal derivatives, nu plus and nu minus are the outer normal derivatives from d plus and d minus. Uh, so the sum of these guys is greater or equal to zero, which means here on the picture that we have this corner, you know, looking down. Okay, so like this. Um, so that's that's the meaning of this this inequality. And the third one is probably the most important one. This is a called complementarity condition that is u minus c times this the sum of this normal derivative is zero. So which means that at the parts where u is greater than than c, so this part here, so it's above u is strictly above c. So the sum of these two derivatives is zero, which means that actually, so you have smooth, there is no corner, okay? So it has to be smooth, okay, like here. So, um, so these are the so-called uh, Signorini complementarity conditions. And these are equivalent for, uh, for the function to be minimizer. Um, now the uh, objectives in the study of this problem, um, 
uh, are, are twofold. So first one is the uh, regularity of, of you of the minimizer. And the second one, which, which is uh, even more interesting is the structure and the regularity of the so-called free boundary, which is the boundary of the contact set. So the set where u equals to psi. So this set where u equals to psi called the coincidence set, so it lives on the thin space. So it's, it's, uh, it's co-dimension one. So this boundary of that set is, is therefore of co-dimension two. Okay, so if we're in dimension n, so this we expect to be an object of dimension n minus two. Of course, I say expect because, you know, um, a priori, we don't know how bad it can be, right? So, um, all right, so uh, now there are, there are uh, you know, uh, many uh, situations where such problems arise and um, probably the original motivation was for this problem and, and you know, having the name of Signorini is that so it's it's uh, it arises in elasticity. So describe describing uh, you know um, the body which is at rest, uh, uh, elastic body at rest on a on a surface, uh, and uh, so it's it's essentially this displacement. So if you try to describe this object, the, the displacement can occur only in one direction. That is, uh, they they can can go below the surface, they can go only up. So it's, it's a unilateral restraint, uh, constraint, sorry. Uh, so, uh, so essentially the problems with unilateral constraints, uh, so give rise to the conditions that I showed earlier, the seniority type con conditions. And, um, and essentially all those kind of problems, unilateral problem, problems, we, we also can call seniority problems. Um, now, uh, the same kind of conditions also appear um, if we describe a flow, let's say, uh, of a saline concentration to, to semi-permeable membrane. Um, so th th that would be a parabolic problem. And uh, so, in, in, uh, so in recent years, there were also some applications in financial math, actually. So, um, so for the uh, you know, evaluation of the stock prices when the, the underlying uh, you know, process is, is, is a jump process. So in, in fact, in that case, uh, so we do get um, a problem with a fractional Laplacian, okay, obstacle problem, the fractional Laplacian. Now you, you can recognize these three conditions here, which are similar to the uh, you know, seniority conditions I had before this U minus being on negative. So this, this would be the sum of those normal derivatives. And in fact, indeed, so, uh, so this, this corresponds to the case, so the Signorini case, the, the case I'm talking about, about uh, today corresponds to S equal to one half. Okay, so um, uh, now in, in, in general, so let me, let me tell a few words about known results. So the, the, let's start with the regularity of the minimizer. Uh, now, even from the picture, you could see that, um, you know, you cannot expect anything better than Lipschitz in, in uh, you know, in the global sense, uh, if you look at the, at the minimizer because of this corner. Um, however, however, so uh, it turns out that in fact, if you, uh, if you, if you restrict yourself to, uh, uh, to the side, on, to the one side from, from this uh, thin space or on the thin space itself, it turns out that actually regularity uh, is better. It's actually C1 better. That is on each side, on each side, on each, on each half here. So you have better regularity than across. I mean, across it's only Lipschitz. And this was known uh, early on. So it's uh, in seventies. Uh, so, uh, so Caffarelli, Kindleher, and Ralso. So they, they gave, in fact, different proofs. Uh, well, it's, you know, maybe under slightly different uh, assumptions uh, and conditions. But essentially, this was uh, was known, um, you know, a long time ago, and um, now, relatively recently, so well, sixty years ago already. So um, uh, there was a, there was a breakthrough in this problem. So when Atanasopoulos and Caffarelli uh, proved that uh, the minimizers are actually C one one half, okay, on on each side. Um, and uh, so, well, that, that started actually a series of works and, and um, now we know a little more. So, so um, 
so this the original result was when uh, uh, this um, thin space was flat and C was zero, but then this was generalized to uh, M still flat, uh, non-zero C and and all other cases, non-flat M's to the to the parabolic problem, to the fractional obstacle problem, in fact, to the one that I that I showed earlier. So um, and and uh, I mean so. I have here a list of, of course, this is not, not exhaustive at all. So there are a lot, lot more works uh, in this direction. Uh, but essentially this, this first work opened up this, uh, you know, uh, the possibility of further studying this problem. Uh, and in fact, actually the second work of Atanasopoulos, Kapel and Salsa was, was more important for, for what I'm going to talk about next. So, um, so the, the structure of the free boundary. So, um, and uh, when I talk about this, I'm going to make a certain simplifying assumption, assumptions when uh, M, this uh, thin space is flat, so it's Xn equal to zero. Uh, so the thin uh, uh, obstacle itself is zero. And uh, so this D is symmetric and also the solution is symmetric with respect to the thin space. Okay, so um, now, um, so the, in, in, in this paper 2008, Atanasopoulos, Kaffrell and Salsa noticed that you know, the, the, the classical Ongren's frequency formula like this. So uh, it's, uh, it, it, it actually works for the minimizers of the thin obstacle problem. Okay, and um, you know, the originally this formula was proved by Ongren for uh, this multi-valued harmonic function, two-valued harmonic, fun harmonic functions. And the real reason this works uh, for the minimizers of the thin obstacle problem, because uh, so there is a way of thinking about them as a two valued harmonic functions. So that is, uh, you know, if you do even an odd extensions uh, of, the, um, of the, the, the minimizer, uh, at least in the case when P is zero, even an odd extensions with respect to the thin space, so it'll get two valued function. And uh, that turns out to be uh, essentially uh, two valued harmonic function in a sense. Okay, so there are technical difficulties there, of course, but but essentially, uh, so that's the reason why uh, this um, uh, this formula works also for the phenomenal problem. Ashok, probably yeah. the reference on Almgren zero zero. <laughs> yeah, zero zero. It's yeah, yeah. That's that's true. It's not in two thousand. Uh, so that's uh, uh, that's when this book was published. Right, so it's yeah, yeah, yeah. It's 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 not 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 that. Uh, uh, yes, uh, that's true. I, I use this, but it's of course not proved. It's it's is the reference to when uh, you know the stick book was published. I, I don't know if you know what I'm talking about. So, uh, uh, but yeah, of course. Uh, so this is not not from 2000. So it's uh, I think uh, late 70s or late 80s. All right, so. Uh, and um, so the, uh, this Ongren's frequency formula uh, gives you a limit because it's monotone. So this, this quantity is monotone. So it, uh, there exists a limit of this frequency formula uh, as we let R go to zero. So uh, we call the denote that by kappa x zero and call the frequency at a point. And uh, uh, so there is a equivalent characterization of this frequency. So it's uh, essentially tells you about the growth rate at the point. So uh, you can define it either in the terms of this uh, ratio of the logarithm of the, this uh, integral mean uh, of u squared or just the supremum over the ball of, of radius r, it, you know, grows like a constant times r to this kappa x zero. Essentially this kappa x zero, the, the limit of this frequency captures this exponent here of R. Okay, so um, uh, of, of course, so this, uh, you know, this tilde sign that I have here has to be, uh, you know, appropriately understood. Okay, uh, so uh, another characterization of Algren, um, this, this frequency is through so-called, uh, uh, so-called blow-ups, which we call Algren blow-ups, um, uh, which are as follows. So we look at the, uh, the, the scalings of the function uh, near uh, near uh, x zero, uh, so uh, and divide by a certain normalization factor. So this normalizes the integral over the boundary of the unit ball. So this integral by which we divide, and so with this uh, renormalization. So if you pass to the limit, 
so um, one can show that so the uh, the blow ups would be homogeneous of, of degree uh, kappa frequency at the point. So uh, homogeneous in this sense that uh, you know this this uh, blow up uh, at evaluated lambda x is lambda to, to kappa. So this lambda to kappa will come out. <clears throat> All right, and um, so one can use this, this frequency to classify the points on the free boundary. So essentially you'll have this foliation of the free boundary. So it'll be union of uh, these gamma kappas where gamma kappa is the point with the fre frequency, uh, fixed frequency kappa. Um, and uh, so what, what proved that Anasopoulos and Caffarel is that in fact kappa, the all possible values of kappa uh, are greater or equal to three half and in fact, even better. So, so uh, they would know that cup is either three half or cup is greater or equal to two. So this, this lowest value, smallest value of cup is actually isolated. Okay, um, and so the next value started at, at, at two. Um, and in fact, in, in n equal to two, so analysis is much, much simpler. So in fact, one, uh, uh, one knows that all possible frequencies are this. So three halves, two, seven halves, four, so essentially, 2m minus one half, so this half integers, and, and 2m. Okay, so these are all the possible um, frequencies that may occur in dimension n equal to two. So, uh, however, uh, in high dimensions, this is not, not fully known. Uh, I think what is known is that in dimension uh, n greater or equal to three, I think so this holds up to dimension uh, Outdoor dimension n minus, I think it's n minus two actually, so not n minus three. So um, uh, wait a second. No, 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 n minus three, n minus three. I think it's co it's correct. So uh, so in in principle, uh, so there could be. So it is it is unknown in high dimensions if there are you know points of of other frequencies, but if there are, so they'll they'll uh, the, the, it will be set of outdoor dimension n minus three. <clears throat> and, and that's due uh, for Cardian Spadara. Uh, now, so the set where kappa equals to three halves, uh, so we'll call a regular set. So this is, um, uh, well, this is a, a traditional terminology. Okay, so, um, and it not necessarily means that these are the only points, you know, around which the, the free boundary is regular. So but rather, uh, uh, at least in this problem, so this regular um, refers to the points of the minimal fre frequency. And in this case, not only uh, it's known, um, I mean, we, we actually know all possible blowups. So all possible blowups, in fact, are uh, uh, functions of this type. So, so this function is the one I showed, showed earlier on the picture. Remember this one with the, you know, the corner, so uh, that's exactly the only possibility that may occur up to, to rotation in the thin space. So uh, in, in the case when frequency is three halves. Okay, um, now um, also we know what are the blow ups in the case when kappa is, is 2m. So when kappa is 2m, um, it turns out that the, the frequency is 2m is, is equivalent to, um, to the fact that the uh, uh, this coincidence set where u equals to the obstacle or equal to zero in this case has uh, density zero, okay, at that point in, in the sense of this limit. Uh, so, and uh, tho those points, uh, again, so terminology comes from the obstacle problem, so are called singular points. So we have regular points uh, where uh, kappa is three halves, then we have singular points where the, the density is zero. And in this case, uh, so uh, it's equivalent to saying that the blow up is a polynomial, okay? Well, the blow up would be polynomial of, of even order and that's why the frequency will have to be uh, 2M. Uh, so, um, and um, in, in fact, so let me go back here. So it is not known, so the blow ups are not really known at all other you know, uh, points. And as I said, so it's not even known if, uh, you know, uh, no other, I mean, all the frequent, the list of all frequencies is not known uh, for sure for n greater or equal to three only up to, to uh, you know, certain uh, error, uh, which, which is a typical result, right? So, um, 
Okay, uh, now, uh, so uh, let me tell what is known about the structure of the free boundary. Uh, so the, the regular part or gamma three halves, uh, so is known to be um, locally n, n minus two dimensional um, real analytic manifold. Uh, so, and um, so the C1, C1 gamma regularity was, was proved in 2008 by Atanasopoulos and Kafala and Salsa. Um, and uh, so the uh, synfinity regularity and the real analyticity was, was proved about at the same time. So uh, by uh, 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 by Daniel and Ovidio, uh, so by and, and uh, real analyticity by uh, 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 Koch, myself, and 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 uh, my student Van Huishi. She. Uh, so at about the same time, but 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 with uh, completely different uh, methods. So. Um, so Daniel and Ovidio's technique is, is more, uh, so it's, it's actually quite interesting, uh, the higher order boundary Harnack inequalities, uh, so uh, which are very interesting by themselves. So our proof was um, uh, by, by using the partial hodograph legendre transform, um, which led to some sub, uh, sub, elliptic, uh, sub elliptic equations, uh, which was again also <laughs> uh, quite interesting. Uh, uh, to see uh, occurring in this problem. Um, now for a singular set, uh, so what, uh, what is known is, uh, is that essentially stratification type result is that so uh, the singular set is contained in a countable union of, of uh, manifolds, C1 log manifold, essentially C1 manifolds with logarithmic models of continuity, that's, that's what it stands for. Um, and I'll, I'll actually talk more about, uh, uh, you know, about this, a better version of this theorem I'll state at the end of the talk, so, because it's, uh, it's a bit long. And so C1 regularity in the sense that it's containing the union of C1 manifolds was proved by uh, Garofalo and myself in 2009. And so this better version with the specific models of continuity was proved by Colombo, uh, Spolauer and Velichko in 2017. So I'll also talk about this, uh, you know, towards the end. <clears throat> All right. So let's now move to um, to almost minimizers. <clears throat> now, in uh, in 1983, uh, Ancelotti uh, considers so-called almost minimizers for the Dirichlet integral, uh, which were uh, as follows. So suppose we have a certain modulus of continuity omega r. Then we say that the function is an almost minimizer. So uh, if, <clears throat> if the following inequality holds um, for any competitor function, that is if you take any function V with the same boundary values uh, on a ball of radius R, uh, so as U, uh, then the integral of gradient U squared will be not just less than or equal to one times this integral, but one plus certain models of continuity, omega R, okay? And this omega R, so we'll assume that it goes to zero as R goes to zero. <clears throat> so, um, now uh, later, so we'll assume that actually omega R is R to a certain power of alpha, alpha between uh, zero and two. So, um, and the motivations for looking at this kind of uh, objects is that, so, so you can view them as some sort of uh, perturbations of, of minimizers in a certain sense, okay? so. Um, and, uh, you know, I don't want to specify exactly what, but, but um, you know, my real motivation for, for looking, uh, looking at this thing was, um, you know, in the case when you have minimizers with, uh, let's say, a holder uh, coefficient, variable coefficient with some holder coefficient sitting in the, in the integral. So, for instance, in those cases, you can think of the minimizers of those integrals as almost minimizers with respect to the uh, you know, functional with the frozen coefficients, okay? So, but what's also interesting is that this almost minimizers um, also um, apply to certain constraint minimizers. So for, in for instance, you know, minimizers uh, with, uh, with fixed volume, you know, uh, uh, for instance, turn out to be in certain problems, turn out to be almost minimizers. 
so uh, also uh, if you if you look at the problems of the underlying PDE, say, and, and other transport term, for instance, those kind of uh, solutions of, of those problems also turn out to be almost minimizers of the, the you know, problem without transport terms um, and so on. So, um, and uh, having this abstraction of an almost minimizer kind of helps to you know, uh, deal uh, nicely with, with, those, uh, with those terms. And uh, so, uh, of course, this notion was also used uh, in uh, geometric measure theory. So I think even earlier, so by by Almgren and and uh, Bombieri. Uh, so there are certain similarities too with those. Um, so now the main complication that uh, arises in the study of almost minimizers is that there is no PD. Okay, so. Um, and essentially everything you do should be by choosing uh, some convenient competitors and applying this almost minimizing property. And uh, so the main type of competitors uh, one uses in, in, in the set in the, you know, in the setting of the Dirichlet integral would be just so-called harmonic replacement. So that is we take the ball of radius R and uh, replace the function U uh, in this ball with the solution of the Dirichlet pro problem. So with the boundary virus equal to, to u, okay? And in this case, so we'll have, uh, we'll have this inequality, the gradient u squared will be one plus omega r uh, integral of the gradient h squared, where h is this harmonic replacement. And in fact, uh, so from this, it's, uh, it's quite straightforward to see this kind of inequality that gradient u minus h squared will be less than omega r times gradient u squared. And this is kind of a manifestation of the fact that, uh, so this almost minimizers are perturbations of minimizers. Okay, if you like. <clears throat> okay, so, um, and uh, so I want to state one theorem um, by Ancelotti because be before I move on uh, <clears throat> to, the thin, uh, to the thin obstacle problem is that it turns out that the almost minimizers with omega r equal to uh, r to power alpha, alpha between zero, uh, zero and two are in fact C1 alpha half. Okay, and um, uh, so I also want to give a sketch of the proof um, very quickly. So the proof is based, I was divided on two, two, into two steps. First, we prove uh, so-called almost Lipschitz regularity that is, uh, you know, a holder regularity with exponents and exponent less than one. And this is done through the Mori space estimate. So one starts with the uh, harmonic uh, replacement age of the function U. And for the harmonic functions, we, we have this kind of inequality. Um, so two concentric balls, B rho uh, and BR, rho less than R. And so this inequality is, is nothing but the subharmonicity property of gradient H squared. Okay, if H is harmonic, gradient H squared is, is subharmonic. So this is the sub mean value property, if you like. Um, and, uh, you know, if you use the perturbation I showed earlier, uh, then actually one can, can establish this perturbed version of this inequality. So for almost minimizer and in almost minimizers. And then this is, this is then, uh, you know, becomes this, this uh, uh, standard, um, Argument. So, if you have a certain, you know, non uh, the uh, non-decreasing functions, uh, right? Some um, model of continuity. Then, uh, so this kind of inequality implies that gradient. Uh, so, we'll have this this bound gradient u squared is less than c rho to any power less than less than this n here, and which we write it in the form n two sigma minus two sigma less any sigma less than one, and this implies. From the Mori uh, space embedding, right, implies that u is, is uh, c0 sigma. Uh, now, c1 alpha half regularity follows from a Campanato space estimates. And again, one starts with the appropriate inequality for, uh, for harmonic function age. So we have that the, you know, this, <clears throat> so uh, this uh, triangular bra braces, uh, they denote the average of this function on the ball of radius rho here. So that is this this os this this oscillation this in, in this L two oscillation essentially uh, is less than uh, this factor over uh, R to power n plus two 
uh, times uh, this again, this L2 oscillation over uh, BR. Um, and uh, this is quite straightforward to prove for harmonic functions. And um, again, H is the harmonic replacement. And if one uses that, you know, um, almost minimizing property, so one can obtain the perturbed version of this inequality in this form. So we'll have an additional factor of C R to power N plus alpha. And from here again, so we can conclude that, so we have an inequality of this type with C rho to N plus alpha and um, from the, the Campanato space you know, uh, embedding. So we'll get that uh, U is C one alpha half. Okay, so that's essentially what uh, <clears throat> it's probably the best one can expect actually uh, from the almost minimizers. All right, now let's talk about the almost minimizers for the thin obstacle problem. So we put these two problems together, okay? So, um, and I'm going to assume that my thin space M is, is flat, is XN equal to zero and my obstacle is zero and my omega R is R to the alpha, alpha between zero and two. And so the almost minimizers for the thin obstacle problem will be uh, quite similar to the one for the Dirichlet um, integral, except we, we have an additional requirement for all functions to be non-negative on the thin space M here. Okay, so <clears throat> that is, so this inequality is satisfied if we uh, apply to, to competitor V, uh, which has the same boundary values, but also this V has to stay above the portion of this uh, a thin space in, in this ball. And this ball doesn't have to be centered on, on the thin space. Okay, um, and <clears throat> again, we are interested in, in the properties such as regularity of the minimizer and also the regularity of the free boundary. Now, here's the interesting thing is that, um, uh, so, so it's, it's, it's essentially, it's, it's, it's kind of ambiguous, uh, no, not ambiguous, ambitious right, to, to ask for the regularity of the free boundary in this case, because uh, again, you don't even know how to write the free boundary condition in this case. So, um, and uh, so it's, it's uh, <clears throat> it, it turns out that actually, it's interesting that we do get um, almost the same uh, regularity, well, up to, to reasonable uh, regularity, up to C1, uh, C1 alpha or C1 log, uh, the same result as, as for the minimizers. So, and uh, the reason for that, it, that, you know, the tools uh, that we use to prove those kind of regularities uh, turns out to be, uh, turn out to be uh, working just fine for almost minimizers, even though requiring quite a bit of work, but, but still um, robust enough to, to work also for the almost minimizers. So, um, and so I uh, also want to mention here some works um, on almost minimizers <clears throat> for uh, other free boundary problem problems. So uh, I think to my knowledge, the first time, uh, you know, almost minimizers for uh, free boundary pro problems were considered by um, Guy David and Tatiana Toro in uh, 2015. Uh, so, and, and then in the subsequent work with, uh, with Max Engelstein. And uh, so, Similar problems, actually, I think this problem um, was also considered by, uh, by Daniele and Ovidio in 2019. And also the thin version of this problem, uh, which is kind of similar to the one that I'm looking at, uh, the, the thin setting. So it uh, was also considered by uh, Daniela and Ovidio in, in 2018, but uh, uh, their approach is, is, is quite different from, uh, from what we do. So uh, our, our approach is, is similar, perhaps a bit with, uh, with the one with, <clears throat> uh, with David Toro and, uh, and uh, Engelstein. So um, uh, there, is, uh, there is one difference though, is that it, for us, it is quite, quite important that the minimizing, the almost minimizing property is multiplicative, okay? So um, uh, there is a variation of the uh, almost minimizing property that you can uh, ask the error to be additive um, instead of just being multiplicative. And um, so uh, the methods for, so for instance, in this paper by uh, David Engelstein and Toro uh, also are applicable to um, uh, additive ones, to the additive almost minimizers. Uh, 
But as we'll see, it's quite important for us to be uh, multiplicative, to have a multiplicative almost minimizer. And again, so the complication uh, is the same as before. So we don't have a, a PDE. Um, and so we have to, to work with the you know, appropriate comparison function, com uh, appropriate uh, competitors. And so we have two kinds of competitors. So we call the first kind we call uh, seniorinia replacements. So these are solutions of the seniorinia problem um, over the ball centered actually on the thin space and having the same boundary values as the, the function u. So we have uh, these three conditions satisfied. So remember this, this was the seniorinia condition here, which was equivalent to uh, being uh, uh, the minimizer. And also the second kind of uh, replacements uh, that turn out to be very, very useful are so-called uh, kappa homogeneous replacements. Again, in the case uh, when, uh, when the points are on the thin, uh, thin space, in particular, so when X, this, this, this center is at the origin, so this homogeneous replacements are essentially, so we take this ball of radius R and we extend the values towards the center in a homogeneous way so that the resulting function is homogeneous of degree kappa. <clears throat> okay, um, now, um, so again, to, to, to state our results, we'll also make to assume that the minimizer is actually symmetric. Uh, so it's the same assumption uh, that was uh, in the case of, of minimizers. <clears throat> and um, so in this case, so we can, uh, we, we start our first result with, uh, with Sok Min was that uh, the almost minimizers are Lipschitz. And uh, the idea of the proof is, is uh, I mean, formally, if you look at it, 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 it looks like uh, the one that Ancelotti had, except so here, so this inequality here um, that we start with. So this, this gradient of H squared H now is the senior linear replacement. So remember, this was the submin value property in the case of harmonic function. And it turns out that actually for the solutions of seniority problem, this quantity is still sub subharmonic. So gradient of H squared is still subharmonic. So the same inequality holds. And so the perturbation still gives the same thing. Okay, so we do get uh, almost Lipschitz regularity pretty much the same way. <clears throat> uh, now C1, uh, C1 beta regularity will turned out to be uh, actually more difficult because uh, remember this, this fact that, you know, the minimizer is actually Lipschitz, right, across. So one has to be careful. So it's not really globally, it's not, not C1 beta. So, um, and uh, so what we actually did, so what we found, what, what works is that, so we look at the, um, not the, the gradient of U, but actually at the even extension of the gradient of U across the thin, thin space. Um, and uh, so it turns out that this guy now has the required hold the regularity property. So these guys hold the regular. So, and, and we do that again uh, through the, uh, you know, Campanato space estimate similar to, uh, to the Ancelotti. And uh, this is obtained uh, from a similar uh, inequality. One, one should prove first for the, the seniorinia replacements and uh, what, what one had to, I mean, we had to do in this case, so we had to look at, you know, even and odd extensions, again, related to the fact that it's kind of also related to value harmonic functions. So not, probably not surprising. So, uh, um, so it, it took, I mean, a, a bit more than just for the harmonic function, but it works in the end. So one can get the C1 beta regularity for, uh, for this even extension of the gradient. And this implies that actually the function is C1 beta for each side, on each side of the, the thin space. <clears throat> All right. So now I want to talk a little bit about the regularity of the uh, free boundary, structure of the free boundary. And so as we saw, you know, a, an important tool was the, the Almgren's frequency function. Um, so if you have a solution of the seniority problem, so this guy, the Almgren's frequency function, N is, is monotone. And it, it plays a fundamental role because it's, 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 you know, it allows to classify the points on the free boundary and, and so on. So we need a version of this formula for almost minimizers. Um, and if you try to prove it directly, so, I mean, it could be tricky, but so uh, what, what happened is that, so um, uh, we found an, an indirect proof 
of the, the monotonicity of this call or a modified version of this quantity, which is quite interesting. Uh, and uh, so, uh, in fact, what we did, uh, we, we proved uh, uh, one parametric uh, a family of monotonicity formulas, so uh, which we, we call vice monotonicity formulas. And uh, this kind of formulas, uh, so here's how they look like. So they go back to the work of Georg Weiss uh, in uh, 1999 for the classical obstacle problem. And uh, they were extended to the case of the thin obstacle problem by, by Garofalo and myself uh, in, in 2009. Uh, so, um, and even at that time, so we knew uh, that this, this, you know, this one parametric family uh, formulas is, is related to the Almgren's formula, but uh, it was kind of a, like a side note you know, for us. So, but it turns out that it, it's actually quite important uh, in the case of almost minimizers, and I'll show you how. <clears throat> so uh, the monotonicity of, of this, uh, you know, vice is functional. <clears throat> it can be proved in the case of the, the uh, Sinorina problem, the obstacle problem, by directly differentiating, so this guy, and um, essentially proving this identity, okay? And uh, this identity also tells you about the case of equality, that is, uh, when, uh, when this... Um, uh, this formula, this Weiss's formula is constant. So it means that this quantity here on the integral is zero, which implies that the, uh, the H has to be homogeneous of degree kappa. Okay. <clears throat> now, so uh, what we proved with, uh, with Song Min is that in the case of almost minimizers, so a uh, slight modification of this formula holds, that is, compared to the uh, obstacle problem, the, to the minimizer. So we have an extra factor here of the, the exponential function e to the you know, a times r alpha. And here we have one minus b r alpha. So as, asymptotically, uh, they are the same as, uh, <clears throat> uh, as for the minimizers. Um, and uh, uh, there are two important things here. So as I mentioned, so it was important for us to work with the uh, multiplicative minimizers. And the important thing also is that, so the errors here are multiplicative. So error here and error there, so they are not additive. So, uh, so a version of this formula war was also proved by um, <clears throat> uh, David, Engelstein, and, and, and Toro. Um, but I think the error that they had uh, was, was additive. So, and, and that, that wouldn't work for us. <clears throat> so we're quite happy to, to discover this uh, uh, multiplicative version. Um, and so what's interesting is that the proof of, uh, of, of this formula uh, is actually equivalent to one single comparison one single, this almost minimizing property with, uh, with a kappa homogeneous function, with a single kappa homogeneous function. So that is, we take a ball, <clears throat> in the case, let's say that the center is zero, uh, we, we look at this kappa homogeneous replacement uh, of the solution U and uh, write this almost minimizing property. And the gradient of use, uh, this, uh, this cup homogeneous replacement can be written in this form in the terms of the original function. So these are your tangential derivatives. So and these are your normal derivatives because of the, the cup homogeneity. Uh, so, <clears throat> and uh, this inequality here, this guy is less than that one. If you do just, just algebraic manipulations so and nothing else, so it turns out to be equivalent to, to this inequality. Uh, so it's, it's uh, uh, and in, in fact, in fact, so uh, what the interesting thing is, this is not even the original proof. No, no, so, so the, uh, I mean, it's not, not, not our proof, what I, what I was saying. So it's actually original, one of the original proofs of Weiss. So, uh, and, and uh, so this idea. And uh, so it works so nicely uh, in, in this case. Okay, so there are, uh, you know, there are, there are at least three different proofs of the monotonicity uh, of Weiss's formula. Um, and so one is, one is this one, so there are, there are two others, so direct differentiation I talked about. So there's also, you know, uh, uh, domain variation methods. So for instance, uh, for instance um, so which is useful in some other settings. So, but, but this particular proof was, uh, was very nice in, in our setting. 
and it it uh, it gives us even uh, this nice quantity, which is almost like like the one <clears throat> in the uh, uh, in the vices formula for minimizer. Okay, and now uh, so actually before I uh, so uh, so now we also can state the Almgren's monotonicity formula. And before I, before I do that, let me go back to the the uh, vices formula here. And here, what I want to notice is that uh, the constant B that we have in this formula, so it can be taken independent of kappa. Okay, so for a range of kappa, so we can find a single constant that works for a range of kappas. Okay, so the, this kappa zero can be whatever we want. So there is no restriction on that. So, um, and so, but, but, uh, so the important thing is that, so we can have this, uh, this B depending only on this, uh, this guy. So this whole expression here, uh, except this kappa here. So the constants are independent of, uh, of kappa. And uh, because of that, so uh, we can prove that if you use an almost minimizer and we choose kappa zero greater or equal to two, anything really, so um, could be hundred, right? Or any, any, any number. Then uh, this quantity here is modified version of truncated and uh, you know, slightly adjusted <clears throat> Algorithm frequency is is non decreasing. So this n here is that that classical algorithm frequency. So the ratio of these two <laughs> two integrals. And here's the proof. Uh, so if we uh, if we have that for certain r uh, this uh, this ratio this n r over uh, one minus b r alpha is less than kappa, then it turns out that it's equivalent. It's completely equivalent to this expression here being negative. And, um, and this is precisely that expression was that in the parentheses and the vices formula. So, so therefore this becomes equivalent to saying that the vices formula with frequency kappa is less than zero, okay? And now since we know that this, this guy is monotone, so if we take any s, s less than r, so we'll have that you know uh, w kappa s is less than or equal to uh, w kappa r, okay, by monotonicity, and uh, and this in in turn implies that n s is less than kappa. So this guy is less than kappa. You take any s less than r is less than kappa. So so this this implication is precisely the monotonicity of this uh, truncated modified frequency. Okay, and again, so the proof is indirect, uh, but but it's, it's kind of nice that it works. Okay, and and once you have that, <clears throat> so you can uh, start doing the the blow ups. Um, so the the uh, look at the Almgren rescalings. So that is, you take u divide by this uh, normalization integral. So it's the same as uh, as one does in the for the minimizers. And um, so it's, it's relatively straightforward. So since we also had the C1 beta regularity to see that the limits exist. And in fact, the limits would be minimizers, not almost minimizers because that, that omega r uh, was going to zero, right? So in, in the limits, if you do blow ups of almost minimizers, so you get minimizers. And this, uh, this tells you uh, that the frequencies at the point that you can define uh, will also have the same property as, as uh, one has for the uh, minimizer, that is the frequency will be either three half or greater or equal to two. <clears throat> All right, so uh, now when it comes to the study of the, uh, this gamma kappas, remember, so we're, uh, we had this foliation of gamma into the uh, gamma kappas, so uh, if we want to study those, so for instance, the regular set gamma three halves or the, the singular set is gamma two m's, then uh, we should be able actually to study the uh, homogeneous rescaling. So homogeneous blow ups and the limits of this homogeneous rescaling like this. Um, now it turns out that in our case, it's more appropriate actually to look at almost couple homogeneous rescaling. So it's slightly modified factor here. Um, and uh, the reason for that is, is uh, because when we take the uh, derivative with respect to R um, of this rescaling, so then uh, we get an expression here, uh, which instead of kappa has kappa times this one minus BR alpha, which, uh, and this is the guy which, uh, which we had in the 
in the estimate for the derivative of the Weiss's formula. <clears throat> okay. And by using, using this, by using this and uh, the estimate we had in the, the devices formula, so we can uh, actually control the rescalings, uh, those almost homogeneous rescalings. So, so, um, so we can show that this happens. And again, uh, because we had the, uh, the inequality for this derivative uh, of Weiss's formula. And uh, directly from this, um, one can conclude this kind of inequality that the L2 norms of the rescalings for R and S are bounded by, <clears throat> by this logarithm uh, times this difference uh, of uh, Weiss's formulas. And also we can uh, control the um, integral of this difference over the unit ball of these two rescalings in a similar way. So we'll get the, the logarithmic term times the difference again. So it's some kind of expressions. Okay, as, as before. Um, and uh, unfortunately, so this logarithmic term is, is really troubling. And um, you, if, you, if you don't have any other information, so the best you can, you can get is, is this, this kind of estimate for the growth uh, of minimizers. So there is this logarithmic term. And also you cannot really conclude that this difference of two rescaling goes to zero. So, so in principle, so the rescalings, if this doesn't happen, so rescalings may rotate and you may end up having you know, more than one blow up. <clears throat> so however, however, because of the estimate here, it turns out that so if you can, can show that uh, this Weiss's formulas, WKRs, grow like a power of R at most, then by doing a dyadic argument, so a simple dyadic argument, so taking this inequality with you know, just the powers of R, the ratio being two, for instance. So you can, uh, you can show uh, that, so you have this growth estimate without logarithm um, at the point, so where, where, uh, where you have this estimate, the, the frequencies where you have this estimate. And also you'll have that the um, rescalings also <clears throat> are on distance, at, at most uh, R to power, so a certain del delta half, this, this delta half actually. Uh, and that would allow you uh, to have the uniqueness of blow ups. And in fact, also allow to, to show this holder dependence of the blow ups from point to point. Okay. Um, uh, another possibility is uh, if you prove that uh, this W case not, not uh, powers of R, but actually decay like a powers of the logarithm of R for a certain delta greater than one, okay? Then if you apply an exponential dyadic argument, that is you take radi radii R equal to, you know, uh, E to power two to K, okay? So if you apply, apply to those, then uh, you can still uh, prove this kind of growth. And uh, for, the, uh, for the difference, of the rescalings, you would have actually this logarithmic models of continuity, okay, to power one minus delta half. So this would be negative. And again, so you will have a, a uniqueness of the blow up. And moreover, you'd be able to prove this logarithmic models of continuity for the dependence from point to point. <clears throat> All right, uh, now, uh, so, those are, so th those are the two possibilities. So, um, and it turns out that uh, the first possibility here that uh, WK is less than a, a power of, of uh, R uh, will be realized in the case when kappa is three halves. And uh, the second possibility uh, will be realized in the case when kappa is 2M. So I'm going to talk about those cases next. So when, when kappa is three halves, okay, here on the top. So if you look at the title, so that uh, it turns out, so there is this, uh, there is this result um, called the epiperimetric inequality, which will allow us to establish this uh, uh, um, power of decay, <clears throat> a rate of decay, the uh, power uh, decay of the uh, um, uh, Weiss's formula. And uh, that's epiperimetric inequality is as follows. <clears throat> so uh, if we have any uh, three half homogeneous function um, in, in a unit ball, which is no negative on, um, on the, uh, the thin space on the ball of uh, 
radius uh, uh, dimension n minus one thin ball, which solves uh, and and age solve the Signorini problem with uh, with this uh, with this boundary values uh, w, then there exists a certain uh, dimensional constant. <clears throat> Uh, such that the energy of the minimizer is is less than one plus uh, one minus eta times the energy of the uh, the homogeneous function. So uh, there is a geometric decay here. Okay, geometric improvement. So one minus eta. Uh, and uh, so uh, this was this result was was proved originally uh, uh, by uh, Garofalo. Uh, Smith Vega Garcia and myself in 2016, and also about at the same time uh, uh, by Foucault and Spadaro. <clears throat> and um, the proofs were more, uh, you know, based on a compactness argument. So uh, we didn't have the uh, precise <clears throat> uh, value for, for this constant. Um, and uh, a bit later, so this was actually made more precise by Colombo, Spolor, and Velichkov. So with at equal to one over two n plus three, and and the proof is also much nicer. So uh, by using the expansion with respect to the the spherical eigenvalues, so it's a uh, um, nicer proof. Um, so uh, the consequence of this uh, inequality is that in fact we could prove. Uh, it's kind of inequality for the derivative of devices formula. So if we uh, again follow the same argument that, that I told just one comparison with the homogeneous replacement, uh, then we'll have this kind of inequality and um, this, this can be integrated rather easily and, and that would imply, imply this one now. So how much time do I have? Hello? Daniela? Yeah, yeah, just, uh, I mean, it's four, but we started at three. Okay, I'll, I'll wrap it up because it's, I'm, I'm almost done, so thank you. Okay, sorry, right. took the time to uh, open my video and I'm, I'm muting myself. Okay, so, <clears throat> all right, so, and remember, so once we have this kind of inequality, we can control the rescalings uh, and uh, the blow-ups. And uh, because of that, so we can we can prove that gamma three half uh, is actually c one c one gamma gamma graph, okay. <clears throat> um, and uh, I, I I won't go into details because so uh, but it's 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 rather standard. So uh, again, the the fact that we had that control uh, on the rescaling so allows to prove the uh, holder continuity uh, for the <clears throat> for the blow ups at the point. And that implies the C1 alpha gamma uh, regularity of the, of the free boundary. Uh, so uh, what is more interesting, uh, so in, is the, in the case when cup equals to 2M. So in this case, so this work by, in the work of by, uh, Colombo, Spolauer and Velichkov, they proved the so-called log epiparametric inequality. So um, which is similar to one that we had before, but now it has, uh, you know, kappa homogeneous functions with kappa equal to 2m. Uh, uh, so with, with this normalization assumptions. And in this case, so the improvement uh, for the energy, so there is no, uh, you know, constant. So, but it's in fact, the improvement is of the, uh, of this power type. So it's, you have one minus epsilon, uh, certain epsilon depending on n and kappa uh, of the, the power of, of, uh, of, of the same quantity. Okay, so, and uh, because of this, so you don't get this uh, geometric improvement as you'd have uh, in the previous case, in the case of the epiparametric inequality, but nevertheless, you do get an improvement. And here's how it works in our case. So if you remember, so I mentioned that we start with the logarithm, so this, this growth estimate, so we had the logarithmic term. Now, uh, if you apply actually, uh, if, if you have this kind of estimate that it implies the estimate uh, for the W, the, uh, kappa, um, and in fact, you also use uh, the epiparametric inequality. So from this kind of estimate, you'll get the, the estimate with a reduced sigma here in the logarithm. So we can reduce sigma by N over N minus two and uh, uh, this would imply also the estimate for <coughs> growth of u. So from here, we can go to there, okay, with slightly improved 
sigma, and we can bootstrap this estimate actually. So we can bootstrap this estimate until we get to, to negative range. Okay, and, and uh, well, we cannot really go to negative range. So we'll get the, the U squared. Uh, so we'll get a constant here. And uh, once we have that, so we'll also get the uh, negative rate uh, here for W uh, cup uh, uh, R. And uh, so we'll have an estimate with, uh, with N, N minus two, uh, which is uh, less than one. And that would imply so he, he the estimate that we'll have, and that will imply the control that we need for the blowups. And once we have the control of the blowups, then uh, so we'll also have, okay, so there's the more, more, more elaborate version of the theorem for the singular set, but essentially, so uh, we'll be able to, to say that the, um, the sigma to or gamma to m, uh, which, which also denote by sigma to m, uh, they are contained in a countable union of uh, d-dimensional manifolds of class C1 log. And this log comes from this logarithmic modulus of continuity we, we have here. Um, and uh, that's all. So sorry for going over time. Thank you, Arsh. Thank you. Yeah, yeah. I guess a few people maybe had to leave. I mean. <laughs> yes, yeah. Sorry. Yes. <laughs> well, thank you very much, Lemmy. Clap my hands. <laughs> Are there any questions? So, so I have a question. So, sorry, the alpha can can be anything between zero and two. No, uh, no restriction on alpha. Yeah, no restriction. No. Okay. Independent of uh, so there is no relationship between alpha and uh, kappa zero. Uh, well, uh, so I mean, kappa zero is a frequency at a point. Uh, so alpha so is, 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 is yes. Yeah. So. I mean, somehow it says that it doesn't matter the frequency, how high the frequency is, the same alpha would work. <clears throat> well, alpha is fixed from the very beginning, right? So, yeah. um, if you mean if we consider it, uh, yeah, so in the sense that if you take, for instance, a minimizer. And you can view it as, as an almost minimizer with any, with any alpha. Yeah, this would be completely independent because, uh, because if you look at the N that we have, um, the al modified Almus frequency. So this is the classical Almus frequency divided one minus B R to the alpha. And this guy goes to zero. And so the frequency will actually be limit of the, uh, the Almus formula itself. Okay, so it's it's independent of alpha, yes. Yeah. So if you view the same same function as a as an almost minimizer with different alphas, yeah, it's it's completely independent because of this fact here, that uh, this factor goes to to one <clears throat> in the limit. So, so so sorry, I'm, I'm a, so one question: Can you do some sort of unique continuations for also all, for the harmonic functions? Oh, that's a good fun, a good question. Uh, I mean, for almost minimizers, we we, we did try. Okay. We could not. <laughs> yeah, we did try that. We did try, uh, and uh, uh, so it's we we could no, we couldn't couldn't do it. And and the reason is that because there is this truncation. There is this truncation kappa zero, which essentially rules out the points of the <clears throat> uh, infinite frequency in a sense that so we don't know if there are points. So there could be points. There could be points of. Uh, infinite order of vanishing. So uh, this formula wouldn't allow to uh, rule them out because we do a truncation. Okay. Yeah, so we, we cannot rule that out, yes. And we wish we could do that, in fact, because so we wanted to use this uh, in, a, in a different problem. So, so there is a, so, uh, and I can tell you what it is actually. So, <clears throat> So when we're looking at, at the problems with the uh, variable coefficients, so we wanted to have a version of almost minimizer that is independent of the DPO morphism. Uh, so because in the definition of this almost minimizers, so the balls are fixed. So these are balls. So when you apply a DPO morphism, uh, so those would, uh, would change to uh, slightly, but, but, but they will change. And uh, uh, so uh, we weren't able actually to show that this notion would be stable uh, 
uh, under diffeomorphisms. morphisms. And if we had the uh, doubling property, which will imply the you know, uh, unique continuation, then, or if we had the unique continuation, we'd be able to do that, but, but we can't. So mm -hmm. we tried, but <laughs> yes. Are there other questions? Well, if not, let's just thank Arshak again for his talk, and uh, which I suppose is the last one of the year of this beautiful 2020. <laughs> yeah, can't wait, you know, until it's Long over. <laughs> 2021, hopefully, <laughs> with the 